السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته To carry on with the special embryology lectures I'm going to cover today the development of the uh, body cavities in the frame I'm Dr. Dalia Saleh Professor and the head of anatomy department at Mansour University Let's start first with the anatomy of the body cavities in order to know their orientation in the adult body. Uh, in this side view, you can see that we have two types of cavities. A dorsal cavity near the back of the body contains uh, the brain and its meninges and also a vertebral uh, canal cavity which uh, contains the spinal cord and its meninges. Eventually, towards the ventral aspect of the body, we have uh, two types of cavities thoracic cavity and abdominal pelvic cavity they are completely separated from each other by the diaphragm uh, while the abdominal and pelvic cavity are continuous with each other there is no separation between them in this front view you can see the pelvic cavity the abdominal cavity and the diaphragm but here in the thoracic cavity it is completely uh, separated into three partitions one in the middle, it's called the pericardial cavity, contains the heart and the great vessels. And on each side, we have the two pleural cavities, and each one contains the lung. Then, let's go back to how these cavities are formed. So, we will start with the formation of the intraembryonic silo. The word silo means a cavity. So, intraembryonic silo means the cavity that lies inside the embryo. In order to understand this, let's go back to the third week of development. This is a top view of an embryonic disc. This is the connecting stalk that holds the caudal end of the embryo to the rest of the gestational sac. And this is the cut end of the amion. And this is the embryonic disc. If we take a cross section in it like this and look at the trilaminal germ layer, uh, we will find this. We have uh, a layer of ectoderm, a layer of endoderm, and a layer of mesoderm. Here in the middle we have the metacord which stimulates the overlying ectoderm to transform into a neural plate which deepen and form the neural groove with two prominent neural folds. And um, with further development the neural folds will approximate to each other. The until they meet with each other and the neural groove now is transformed into a neural tube and the neural fold cells will form the neural crest cells and the surface ectoderm will close up in the same time the intraembryonic uh, mesoderm will differentiate into three distinct layers paraaxial uh, mesoderm close to the axis of the body or close to the nodal cord and this will form the somites and intermediate uh, mesoderm which will give us the genitourinary system what concerns us here in the lateral plate is the appearance of a space that uh, will split the lateral plate mesoderm into two layers the somatic layer and the splanchnic layer. The somatic layer together with the overlying ectoderm will form the somatopleuric layer or somatopleur, while the splanchnic mesoderm together with the underlying endoderm will form the splanchnopleuric layer or splanchnopleur. Uh, at this stage, there will be free communication between the intraembryonic ceylon uh, and also the extra embryonic silum. This is the same uh, cut section like we saw in the previous picture, but Let's see what happens in the fourth week of development when uh, there is folding of the embryo. Because at this uh, week, there is folding of the embryo or changing in the shape of the embryo into uh, two ways. 
there will be side to side folding we call it lateral folding and also there is cephalocaudal folding let's revise this picture again this is the trilaminar germ layer this is the ectoderm endoderm intraembryonic mesoderm extraembryonic mesoderm amniotic cavity yolk sac cavity and here we have the extraembryonic coelom In this picture, you can see uh, the differentiation of the intraembryonic mesoderm into three distinct regions the paraaxial mesoderm, the intermediate mesoderm, and the lateral plate mesoderm. And it's splitting into two layers splanchnic layer here and somatic layer, and in between them lies the intraembryonic coelom. This is with further development. You can see here how the intraembryonic coelom and the extraembryonic coelom communicate uh, with each other. With further folding, the amniotic cavity expands and the yolk sac, sac cavity becomes smaller, and the part of it will be incorporated or enclosed within the body of the embryo. Still, there is communication between the intraembryonic uh, coelom and the extraembryonic coelom. With more and more development and more and more folding, the amniotic cavity um, edges approximate to each other. Part of the yolk sac is incorporated inside the body and part is a pinch of uh, the body. Till the amniotic cavity completely surrounds the embryo and the ventral aspect of the embryo now closes completely. So in this picture you can see now uh, the um, intraembryonic coelom enclosed within the abdominal region. So this is the peritoneal cavity and inside it lies the intestine. Let's go back to the third week again and see the formation of the intraembryonic coelom from a different view. This is the embryonic disc. We can see the cut edge of the amnion. We can see the connecting stalk, and this is the embryonic disc seen from above. This is the caudal end of the embryo where you can see the primitive streak here, and this white part is the cephalic end of the embryo. In front of the cephalic end of the embryo, or at the most cranial end of the embryo, there is the cardiogenic area. It is called the cardiogenic area because the heart is formed here. Back to the intraembryonic coelom. If we consider that this is where is the lateral plate of mesoderm lies here, so the intraembryonic coelom will be formed on the sides of the body and also extend uh, at the cardiogenic area to form the pericardial cavity here. So at the side we will have the peritoneal cavity. This is before folding when the embryo will fold so that these two limbs will approximate to each other and form a single cavity. So this is the peritoneal cavity at the sides and this is the pericardial cavity at the cardiogenic area. And there is a free communication between the uh, pericardial cavity and the peritoneal cavity through two canals here, this one and this one. These are called the pericardio peritoneal canals. And the peritoneal cavity at the ends here are uh, in free communication with the extra embryonic mesoderm. So the fluids or structures can, or substances can. Um, travel here from the extraembryonic coelom to the intraembryonic coelom.
if we take a section in this region, we're gonna end up with this picture. Here you can see um, from cranial to caudal, we have the cardiogenic area here, the pericardial cavity is dorsal, ventral to it lies the developing heart, and this is the neural tube. Let's just rotate it like this in order to um, see it more in a better way. So this is the developing brain. It expands and when it expands it will cause the cephalic rotation of the embryo. This is the area where is the future mouse will be or parenchyma membrane. This is the pericardial cavity and this is the heart uh, formation region or the heart tube. Of course, this is the amniotic cavity, and here will be the yolk sac cavity. With further uh, folding, because of the expansion of the brain, um, there will be cephalic folding or formation of the head fold, and this area will tilt or rotate downward like this. So now the foregut will be formed and uh, the heart now is dorsal to the pericardial cavity. Let's see it again from another view. This is the neural tube and this is the brain here. If we take a section, okay, and look at it from the side. So this is the brain. It grows, thus when it grows, it causes the formation of the head fold. And this is the foregut here. Below it lies the developing heart. And here is the pericardial cavity. Now the heart is dorsal to the pericardial cavity. Uh, the, the rest of the uh, intraimperionic serum here at the sides are the peritoneal cavity. The peritoneal cavity and the pericardial cavity are connected by two canals. They are called pericardio-peritoneal canals. Now there is partial separation between the pericardial cavity and the peritoneal cavity through this septum or piece of mesoderm. It is called the septum transversum. Still there is free communication between the extraimperionic coelom and the intraimperionic coelom uh, like this. So nutrition and substances can freely move between the extraimperionic coelom and the intraimperionic coelom. It goes through the peritoneal cavity, the pericardial peritoneal canals, the pericardial cavity, and out again from the extra embryonic silo. So don't forget that we have the intra embryonic silo in this view uh, is formed of the following peritoneal cavity, pericardial cavity. They communicate with each other through the pericardio peritoneal canals. The pericardial cavity is separated from the peritoneal cavity by the septum transverse. Let's now move to the pericardial cavity and see how it is developed. In this picture, you can see how the thoracic cavity is partially separated from the peritoneal cavity or abdominal cavity by the septum transversum. So, uh, two canals uh, lies posterior to the septum transversum, which uh, communicates the thoracic cavity with the uh, abdominal cavity, like we called them before, the pericardio peritoneal canals. If we take a section in this region, we're going to see this uh, in this cross section. This is the uh, dorsal aspect of the embryo where you can see the neural tube is formed here. Below it the yellow tube is represented here by the pharynx. 
and then we have the heart it invades or invaginates the pericardial cavity this is the pericardial cavity with further development the lung buds now start to appear here and grow and in the same time two folds of mesoderm arise they are called pleuropericardial folds or pleuropericardial membranes they carry uh, one of the cardinal veins and the phrenic nerves with them and they try to approximate each other like this carrying the vein and the nerve within them and when they approximate more and more they start to join till they surround the developing heart completely like this and separated from the rest of the thoracic cavity so the two veins will form the inferior vena cava and the phrenic nerves lie on the wall of the pericardium each side of the wall of the pericardium down to their way to the diaphragm and of course the heart lies here within the pericardial cavity to see how the two pleural cavities develop again this is the neural tube this is the pharynx this is the pericardial cavity and this is the heart tube in which I need it and then the appearance of the two pleuro pericardial uh, membranes or folds they try to approximate each other but here look at the region of the pharynx the two lung buds now appear and start to grow like this they grow more and more and they invaginate uh, the intraembryonic coelom and find their way inside them and in the same time the two pleuropericardial folds approximate to uh, each other and fuse and also the two lung buds get bigger and bigger till now the two uh, pleuropericardial folds meet and fuse and completely separates the pericardial cavity from the two newly formed pleural cavities Now the pleural cavity grow on the sides and also in the uh, front. So at the other stage, we can see that the lungs surround uh, the heart from both sides and also uh, surround it uh, or cover it from the front as well. To see uh, the separation of the pericardial cavity from the pleural uh, cavity, uh, let's look at this diagram. This is another view. You can see a cross section here the pore gut and the two lung buds originate from it original pericardial cavity this big one now separates into two by uh, the appearance of the pleuro pericardial folds uh, they will approximate with each other and fuse thus the separation of the pericardial cavity from the two pleural cavities will take place In this picture, you can see how the thoracic cavity is partially divided from the abdominal cavity by the septum transversum. Still, we have two canals communicating uh, the thoracic cavity with the abdominal cavity. We call these canals the pericardio uh, peritoneal canals. Why we call it like this? Because originally we have only the pericardial cavity and the peritoneal cavity why we have only per pericardial cavity remember that the heart is the first organ to develop that's why this cavity was called the pericardial cavity so we have these two canals the pericardial peritoneal canals uh, freely communicating the thoracic cavity with the abdominal cavity after uh, the appearance of the lung buds 
and the develop and the separation of the pericardial cavity into pericardial cavity and two pleural cavities. Now we need to complete uh, the separation of the thoracic cavity with the abdominal cavity, and we need to close this uh, pericardial peritoneal canals, the membrane that will uh, cover these openings together with the septum transversum. Now we will call it the pleuroperitoneal membranes. So how the thoracic cavity is uh, separated from the abdominal cavity? This is by the development of the next organ which is called the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is a composite structure, develops from many areas. First, the septum transversum. The pleuroperitoneal membranes, the dorsal mesentery around the esophagus and dorsal aorta, and also the lateral body wall. Back to the septum transversum, we already mentioned it many times. If you take a section at its level, we're going to see uh, this is the septum transversum which partially separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity or the pericardial cavity from the peritoneal cavity and behind it lies the two pericardial peritoneal canals. The septum transversum grows from the ventral body wall, separates the heart from the liver and posterior to it lies the pericardial peritoneal canals. It gives, finally, the central tendon of the diaphragm. What about the pleuroperitoneal membranes? Remember that now the pericardial cavity is separated into pericardial and two pleural cavities. So the membrane that will close up the pericardial peritoneal canals will be named the pleuroperitoneal membranes. So don't be confused with the naming. The pleuroperitoneal membrane fuses with the dorsal mesentery of the esophagus and also with the septum transversum to completely uh, partition the uh, thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. So in the adult, they will form part of the posterolateral uh, aspect of the diaphragm. The third component is the dorsal mesentery of the esophagus and the, the mesentery that surrounds the aorta. It constitutes the median part of the diaphragm. And in the adults will give us the crura of the diaphragm or the vertebral origin of the diaphragm, the right cross and the left cross. The last component is the body wall, how it shares information of the uh, diaphragm. Um, this is result from uh, growth of the lungs and the pleural cavities because they expand in lateral direction and also in uh, caudal direction. So the body wall splits into two layers. External becomes the body wall and internal layer cons contributes to the peripheral part of the diaphragm. Next, we have an important issue, which is the descent of the diaphragm, and this explains the, its nervous supply. At the third week of development, it develops at the cervical region, and then descends downward, dragging its nervous supply along with it. So in the sixth week of development, now it moves from the level of the cervical vertebrae to the middle thoracic region, and by the eighth week of development, it moves down to the first uh, lumbar region. So its nervous supply, its motor, comes from the phrenic nerve or uh, cervical nerves 3, 4, and 5. And its sensory nerve supply comes from the lower 6 intercostal nerve. For the anomalies of the diaphragm, because it is a composite structure, so any defect in its development can easily happen. So we could have a posterolateral hernia when there is defect in the pleuroperitoneal membranes or a retrosternal hernia when there is defect at the anterior attachment of the diaphragm to the sternum 
um, this will lead to the herniation of the abdominal organs up in the thorax and collapsing of the lungs and also shifting of the heart in this view you can see a side view here where you can see the esophageal opening surrounded by the cross uh, of the, the fam and of course below it lies the abdominal part of the esophagus and the fundus of the stomach if there is incompetency in this opening uh, we will end up with what's called the hiatal hernia so part of the stomach will be dragged up in the thoracic cavity with all of its complications and this is the end of my presentation thanks for listening please do not forget to subscribe like and share